We use optical flow everywhere, on things that move and on things that see. If you flip your mouse over and you see this red light, it's likely an optical mouse using optical flow to calculate mouse movement. Before we start the video, we need to define optical flow. Optical flow is the perceived motion of brightness patterns in a sequence of images. There's many ways to calculate optical flow, but we're going to start with a common way, the Lucas Canade way. You're probably asking yourself, why though? What's the story behind this video? Let's go for a walk and talk. We've got our black tripod, our black string, our black watch. We also got our black water bottle. I was a video editor before I did all of this. Motion effects was a limitation in open source video editing. So one of my dreams as a teenager was to create this GPU accelerated motion estimation algorithm that can work on modest setups. I'm 26 now, I achieved this dream and I would like to share with the world how it's shade. So we're going to get started straight into this video starting with the brightness constancy assumption. The brightness constancy assumption assumes that a moving object's brightness stays constant as it moves. So we have this white cube and if we move the cube to the right and we move this cube up, this cube would stay white as it was before. This equation is nonlinear because it tells us that this pixel at x and y equals this other pixel at x plus u and y plus v. We use the Taylor series expansion to linearize this equation to derivatives. Linearizing means that we turn this nonlinear equation into a linear equation. The linearized equation allows us to find the rate of change from x and y to x plus u and y plus v. So I'm going to demonstrate the aperture problem using this strap. Let's begin. In that example, the strap did not move horizontally. It did not move diagonally either, even though it looks like it. When you pull the aperture out, you can see that the object actually moved vertically. The aperture problem shows us that our limited perception of an object's movement prevents us from seeing its true movement. Your underpaid teacher wants you to answer for u and v using just this equation. The student to your left answers 3, negative 7. The student to your right answers a similar answer but flips the sign around. As you can see, both students are correct. This equation generates no unique answers. Graphing these answers form a line, and within this line is all the possible answers. The Lucas Canati method assumes local constancy. Local constancy means that all the pixels within this window should have the same motion. This means that we can solve for multiple equations using the same unknowns. So let's calculate the gradients of the first three pixels within this small window and we get this result. We need to find a u and v that satisfies all of these equations simultaneously. While we assume that all of the pixels within this window should move in the same direction, the reality is there's image noise and image noise would not give us the perfect solution that satisfies all of these equations. As a compromise, we use the least square solution to find the result that satisfies all of these results simultaneously. These equations follow a similar pattern so we can turn it into matrix form. On the left hand side, we have the dot product between the x and y derivatives and u and v. We turn the right side into a matrix even though it's a single value. This represents our temporal derivative. This is a single optical flow equation in matrix form. And this is a system of optical flow equations in matrix form. We will use ax equals b to represent our systems of optical flow equations. On the right hand side we have A which contains our x and y derivatives which measures brightness changes over the horizontal and vertical directions. X contains the motion we want to estimate. B contains the t derivative which measures brightness changes over time. We cannot invert A at this point because A is not a square matrix, it's a rectangular matrix with more rows than columns. We solve this by multiplying both sides by the transpose of A. 
Now A is a square matrix where it's the x and y derivatives multiplied across each other and by itself. We also simplify the right hand side by turning it into a matrix that contains the sum of the t derivative multiplied by the x and y derivatives. We move A from the left side to the right side by multiplying both sides by the inverse of A. A multiplied by its inverse cancels out, so we're left with x on the left hand side only. So now we're left with this optical flow equation where u and v equals these matrix multiplications. We're going to test the shader in the most powerful game in the world, Sims 4. So I'm currently playing The Sims and we have my Sims Yaku cooking and so you can see he's going kind of hard. Um, Johnny Zest would like to come over. Is that okay? Yeah, I can come over and hang out. I'm here to test my optical flow shader. We're also here to hang out with Johnny Zest. So, as we're preparing to cook a meal for Johnny Zest, here's my optical flow shader in The Sims 4. And as you can see, it runs pretty well with small movement. Now, Johnny Zest is at the door and he's right behind me. Um, and look. Kind of zesty here, but uh, yeah, this is my optical flow shader. But let's see how it works in big movement. So I'm gonna hop over from The Sims 4 to another game. We will use this game to test my optical flow shader because it has a mix of small and large movement. So we're going to let the character play some idle animations so we can review it later on. As you can see, the optical flow works pretty well on small movement. You notice our current algorithm starts to break down at large movement because you notice gaps between frames 1 and 2. These gaps represent a violation in the brightness constancy assumption of small movement. The pixels in these regions move more than a single pixel. We need to find a way to measure large movement while considering it measuring a single pixel. We achieve this through downscaling. This is the original image, and this is that image after downscaling. Now you see, each pixel has a greater contribution to the image. We start with two frames, frame 1 and frame 2. First we calculate motion vectors between the smallest versions of the frames. Then we move to a larger version of the frames. We use our motion vectors to push frame 1 towards frame 2. Then we calculate the optical flow between frame 1 and 2 again. We create a new optical flow by adding the current estimate to the previous. Then we repeat this step until we reach the largest versions of each frame. This is course to find Lucas Canade as a shader. I want to end this video with gratitude. Thank you to my family and friends. Your names are not on here, you know who you are. Thank you to the Project Reality team for making me a more well-rounded developer. Thank you to all the people who supported my Reshape project one way or another. And thank you to all the supporters of this channel and you, the viewer. And I wish everyone here a really good weekend.